Hello, everyone. Uh, we're very glad all of you are with us today. At, this is the second annual Undergraduate Research Library Symposium. And of course, we're doing it a little bit differently this year, as you know. Um, we're very glad to see so many of our colleagues attending and uh, want to just go over the agenda briefly. I'm going to make a few comments. Jen Schnabel is, is going to make some comments, then we're going to hear from five of our undergraduate research library fellowship students, and then there will be a, uh, a question and answer period. So we hope many of you will be able to ask questions uh, in the way that's already been mentioned. So briefly, I um, want to talk about who our fellows were this year and who worked with them, which of our librarians worked with them. Mia Cariello and um, Sean Walls were mentored by Lee Bonds. Danny Wallerman was mentored by Hilary Bussell. June Beavers was mentored by Hannah Primo. Catherine Watson was mentored by Jen Schnabel. And uh, Hannah Stella was, was mentored by Tina Schneider. Um, I have given on the next slide, a couple of slides actually, if we can go to those, the, the actual topics and we'll be saving these slides so that you can see what the actual topics are. You'll be hearing more from the students themselves as, as they talk about these. Uh, Mia Cariello will be going first today and she uh, worked on a creation of a digital exhibit of anti-sexual violence activism at Ohio State. Hannah Stoll worked um, on oral histories and archival research on women faculty administrators at the Lima campus. We can go to the next slide. Uh, Sean Walls worked on a literature review on a, on a philosophy topic, the dichotomy and its manifestations in Hellenic thought as contrasted with thought of, among indigenous populations. Catherine Watson worked on a study uh, of textual analysis, using textual analysis of the enemy's lovers trope and, and Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and other popular literature uh, from British 18th and 19th centuries. And Danny Wallerman worked on a study of female refugees experience in central Ohio through interviews, archival research and data analysis. The, a really wide range of topics this year. We were very, very pleased. The Teaching and Learning Committee was very, very pleased to see such a wide range of very interesting topics and varied research methodologies that the students used this year. Just want to say that um, the Undergraduate Research Library Fellowship is now in its, in its fifth year. We've had 29 students, counting the students this year who have gone through the fellowship. Uh, I think all of them have benefited enormously from the experience and um, they, they've learned how to wrestle with a complex research topic and work under the guidance of a librarian, a, a faculty mentor, and working on that topic over an extended period. So that's the big goal for the Undergraduate Research Library Fellowship. And I'm going to turn it over to Jen now. Hello everyone, I'm Jen Schnabel, English librarian, and I have had the privilege of mentoring uh, four students so far through this program and uh, Craig was able to talk about the benefits to the students, but um, I feel like mentoring has benefited me immensely. I've gotten to spend time with students doing an in-depth research project, which is not, which is not always the case um, as a librarian at a gigantic institution like Ohio State. Um, so this this program, we always host a symposium each year to highlight the projects that the fellowship students worked on over the summer, but also to reiterate the library's commitment to supporting undergraduate research and creative inquiry at OSU. Um, so glad we were able to do this event virtually uh, this year. And I wanna give a special thanks to Quinetta Batts and Shannon Niemeyer for facilitating this webinar and our communications team for their help with promotion. Um, so without further ado, I will turn this over to Mia and um, Craig already uh, introduced all the students. So we're just going to go from one presentation to the next and save a Q&A till the end. And you'll see me then.
on. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, okay. Thank you so much for coming to this symposium. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Mia Sai Cariello, she, her, her pronouns, and I studied um, anti-rape organizations and protests at The Ohio State University from 1970 to present. And here's my presentation roadmap. So first we're gonna go over the goals of my research. Then we're gonna discuss the methods that I used to conduct this research, the limitations of my methods and accomplishments and my final project. So my goals during this research was to archive, um, analyze, collect, and inform. So I'm gonna go through each of these goals and sort of break them down and what those words actually mean to me. So archiving protest history, um, I wanted to document all available anti-rape protests related documents at OSU on campus and off. Um, so that includes interviews, um, articles, um, flyers. I wanted to analyze the outcomes of these activisms that are being documented. Um, so organizations and individuals um, impact on campus policy and procedures. I wanted to collect firsthand testimony um, that was omitted from Navy newspapers um, through conducting my own individual interviews with past and present um, activists. And I wanted to inform. So how can my research inform strategies for the future? So what type of anti-rape strategies have worked in the past um, effectively and consistently, and how can we utilize that in our current position um, now and into the future. And here are my methods. So I can go over these um, individually as well. So I utilize the Lanterns digital archives as my main source of artifacts due to the COVID-19 limitations. I was originally intending to go into the OSU stacks um, and look for pamphlets, all of this stuff, but Due to COVID-19, I was limited to what resources I could use. So a predominant amount of my artifacts um, and articles that I used are from the Lanterns digital archives. I conducted interviews with past and present anti-rape activists through um, video calls and email. Um, we used archival methods and best practices for building historical collections and exhibits with primary source documents um, to ensure that research is both comprehensive as well as accessible to the general public. And I uploaded artifacts with metadata and built a digital exhibit using the Omega platform. And I also analyzed sources through the theoretical lens of intersectional feminism. Um, here are three of my biggest limitations with my research. Um, the Lantern. Um, even though it's an amazing student um, newspaper, articles do not always tell the whole story um, and may even omit people or events that played a crucial role in influencing how history um, occurred. Interviewees, um, it was very difficult for me to get in contact um, or find interviewees or potential interviewees um, from the 1970s um, and 80s. Um, a predominant amount of the interviews I conducted were from people who were on campus um, late 80s to 90s and early 2000s um, and present in the last five years. And another limitation is that this process of anti-rape activism um, is ongoing. So nothing has been solidified as like final or finalized um, and recent anti-rape movements are ongoing so their impact is hard to discern now um, and I think that looking backwards onto my artifacts this has been very evident because during the time that they were being documented no one could have predicted how much change um, or not they you know implemented on campus and here are my four biggest accomplishments through this research I archived um, over 200 artifacts into the Reclaiming Our Histories um, project website. Um, that includes articles, photographs, interviews, um, donated um, certificates uh, and the like. I interviewed eight different people um, via video interviews. Um, I, had uh, <laughs> I had four plus hours of testimony and two written interviews. Um, I also was able to do anonymous interviews um, with the most current um, activists who wanted to keep their identity anonymous. And that was really great. Um, I also wrote around 9,000 words summarizing my findings within my um, project. And I structured information into 15 sections and integrated my research into a larger Reclaiming Our Histories project, which is headed by Dr. Maithili Srinivas and Lee Bonds. Um, and then this is sort of a snapshot of my final project. 
um, a digital exhibit house within the Reclaiming Our Histories project, um, which has many other exhibits such as um, information on the rape education um, prevention program, um, women's student government, um, and the history of LGBT protests at OSU. So it's in great company and I was able to integrate uh, my research into these other topics um, because of their intersections and in activism. So this is sort of the roadmap of my research. So it has 15 which is chronological order, um, starting with setting the stage um, in 1970, 1969, um, following the different key groups and movements throughout the last 50 years and ending on critiques and opposition um, to these movements and um, their current renditions as well. So this is sort of what my web pages look like. Um, they are integrated with text and artifacts, integrated articles from the lanterns, interviews and photographs throughout the exhibit um, give viewers a quick access to materials and ability to engage with the material at their own pace while they're reading through um, my written summary of my own findings. Um, and I want to make this as accessible to um, viewers. So you have a lot of pictures to bring up heavy text boxes, um, videos are integrated. So I tried to make it as viewer friendly as possible. Additionally, here is sort of what the metadata looks like on the website. So for this example of Asian women against rape, this is a photograph um, from the 90s of, on this group and it will appear on the website like this. So you have the artifact and then you have the metadata with it. So you have titles, descriptions, date created, creator, publisher. Um, and in this case, I had several alumni donate this photo to me. So the creator is right here, which has made it really important as a collaborative project, not just my own, um, that all of these other past and present activists can donate what they have um, to be archived along any side um, articles that I find. Um, and that is sort of what the metadata looks like for each of these artifacts, over 200 of them. And I also wanted to discuss the recording now. So I discussed earlier how this is an ongoing process um, and we don't really know where we're gonna land um, in the next 50 years either. So I wanted to document recent events to ensure preservation so it won't be as difficult to find this information um, later on. So I interviewed recent OSU activists and alumni, and I'm also in the process of preserving digital promotional materials such as social media flyers, um, posts, tweets, um, and the likes. Um, all of these photos from Take Back the Night recently have happened in the last three years. Um, I've been interviewing people who currently work at OSU and have been previously working at OSU um, and students. So all of this um, not only brings to life the history um, but also shows how history has been an ongoing process still. And here's sort of what I learned, the key takeaways. So what I learned was um, direct action works. So there is a correlation between direct action protests and anti-rape policy changes at Ohio State. Um, intergenerational knowledge. Um, anti-rape activists of the past inform the activists of present and future. Over the 50 years from 1970 to present, almost every single anti-rape organization um, I was able to find and document, there were activists from the previous generation influencing the newer generation. So intergenerational knowledge between anti-rape activist groups um, and individuals seem to be the biggest lifeline of, you know, integrating these ideals into society. Varying strategies. So anti-rape activism is not always just protesting in the streets, but they had a different strategy depending on their audience demographics and goals. So there was different, there were sometimes poetry readings, there were sometimes protests on the Oval, there was sometimes flyer distribution or educational programs, um, but it really varied. There was no one fit all um, to strategies on anti-rape activism. A majority of anti-rape movements have also been student-led. Almost every single um, anti-rape movement and activism um, in the last 50 years in Ohio, um, not Ohio, in Columbus and at OSU have been predominantly student-led um, with a unique um, emphasis on students in the women's gender and sexuality studies, um, especially after 1985, they have been um, predominantly the planning committees for most of the Take Back the Night marches in the last 20 years. Um, intersectional coalitions, coalitions built 
among varying groups, especially the LGBTQ community, um, have been critical to anti-rape movement. Um, and they take a lot of protest strategies that were used um, in various different demographics to sort of build a hybrid of sorts, um, which is sort of touching on the varying strategies that were used. There was also a gradual shift in location. So Take Back the Night marches shifted from the greater Columbus area, typically downtown um, near Goodall Park, um, with numbers ranging in the 500 to over 2000. Um, however, these numbers have decreased over the years as the Take Back the Night marches became more a campus specific event. Um, and that's really interesting to me, um, just because the students themselves who were planning them, they planned the ones downtown, they planned the one on campus. Um, what made the geographical shift um, a priority for students and how does that in fact, in fact influence the greater Columbus area um, knowledge and awareness of anti-rape activism in their own communities? And I really want to thank you all for being here. Um, as you know, this is an ongoing process and I think that documenting all of this um, now will help hopefully help anti-rape activists in the future. Um, and I really want to say thank you to everyone who has supported me during this project um, and to all of my friends who are also the people who are marching with me every year on campus. So thank you so much for having me present this. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Hannah Stahl and I'm a fourth year English major at The Ohio State University at Lima. My undergraduate research was focused on conducting oral history interviews with women on the Lima Regional Campus to let their voices and experiences be heard for perhaps the first time. Specifically, my research project was centered around the question, how have women experienced being administration, faculty, and staff members on the Ohio State University campus in Lima? This question was specifically explored by conducting oral history interviews with several different female administration, faculty, and staff members, past and present, and studying their impact on the Lima campus and the university as a whole. Why the need to highlight women of regional campuses? There is limited literature on regional campus faculty and even less information regarding academic women on these campuses. Part of my reason for choosing this project was to provide oral histories from women on the Lima Regional Campus to alleviate the noticeable gap in the Ohio State University Archives Voices of Women Oral History Project. I also had the opportunity to record specific voices and experiences on the Lima campus that had not previously had an audience before. To the best of our knowledge, my project is the first to bring forward voices from a regional campus. Why oral history interviews? Oral histories are valuable primary sources that lend new insights into a specific time and place. Preserving and archiving oral histories allows future generations to hear the past from the people who experienced it. While there are a multitude of wonderful women who have impacted the Lima campus, I chose to contact and interview these seven women specifically. Dr. Violet Meek, Dean Charlene Gilbert, Dr. Sabina Yeshenek, Dr. Maria Ignasheva, Dr. Beth Sutton Ramsbeck, Ms. Temple Patton, and Ms. Karen Meyer. These women offer unique perspectives from administration, faculty, and staff positions, respectively. Let's begin with administration. While interviewing each woman who led the Lima campus, I was struck by the way both deans reached out to Lima and surrounding communities to make an Ohio State education possible for all residents of the state. For example, during the 90s when she was dean, Dr. Meek established a program called Women in the 90s, or WIN, that was designed to assist women over the age of 25 who were non-traditional students with their transition into student life. This program encouraged more women to return or enroll and receive a college education. During her time at The Ohio State University at Lima, Dean Gilbert led the campus in establishing a major wide campus leadership training, educating students on topics such as race and power, ability, and sexuality. Her success surrounding educating students and faculty on equity and diversity issues saw a substantial increase in the diversity of the campus. 
Furthermore, each, during each interview with faculty, I was struck by the impact of each woman on the surrounding community, as well as being inspired by their dedication to introducing new and valuable subject matter to the students on the Lima campus. For instance, Dr. Sabina Yeshnik assists Rachel Richardson, who is the coordinator of career services on the Lima campus, in facilitating the Girls Who Code Club. In this club, Dr. Yeshnik teaches young girls from middle school to high school age about coding, a skill she uses in her everyday work as a theoretical physicist. Dr. Yeshnik explains that she hopes to continue to be a role model for young women who are interested in STEM fields. Moreover, when Dr. Maria Ignasheva came to the Lima campus, she noticed a lack in children's theater in Lima which she describes as offering children a form of learning, experience, and excitement. As a result, she began the program Theater for Young Audiences on the Lima campus in 1995. The program is celebrating its 25th year of existence this year. Although Dr. Beth Sutton Ramsbeck is well known for her engaging English courses, she also taught women and gender studies courses that she describes as having a significant impact on her students. In her interview, Dr. Sutton Ramsbeck explains how there were a lot of students who were there because they needed to be. They needed to have tools to understand what had happened to them and what they experienced and what they were going through. I had a classroom full of people who were hurting very badly. I felt on the one hand that I was really helping some people more than I even realized, that they were not at fault and that it's a systematic problem. They needed those tools and I felt like they were being served by the class in a way that I'd never really thought I'd serve students before. Dr. Sutton Ramsbeck emphasizes in her interview that there is a continued need for education on women and gender studies on the Lima campus, as this knowledge is essential in helping students. Additionally, after interviewing both staff members, I noticed the strong differences in opinion regarding issues of equity and inclusion. Both interviewees were first-generation students on the Lima campus who subsequently took staff positions here. However, Temple Patton, who began on the Ohio State Lima campus as a non-traditional student and fulfills both the Associate Director for Diversity and Inclusion role and the Program Coordinator of Business role, explains that her salary is nowhere near what her predecessor's was and he only held one position. Patton attributes this difference to the fact that she is a woman of color and works in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion as well as with the Human Resource Office to ensure that more women of color are represented at The Ohio State University at Lima. Additionally, in 2007, Patton developed the DREAM program with Beth Keen, which is a scholarship for first-generation students exclusive to the Lima campus. Patton states that there have been over 100 students that have gone through the program and have been helped by it. Karen Meyer states in her interview that during her time on the Lima campus, she has felt respected and hasn't felt any type of di discrimination as a woman. However, she mentions that she feels as though her age has limited her access to promotions. Meyer has been the coordinator for disability services on the Lima campus since 1998 and has served as an academic advisor since 2000. Overall, Meyer describes her experience on the Lima campus as very positive and enjoyable. Throughout this process, I've discovered how important community and service to community are. Also, I've been stunned by how the actions of people in the past imp impact us now in the future. In my case, I never would have been able to receive a bachelor's degree in English in my hometown, where I was born and raised, without Dr. Meek's endeavors to bring more majors to the Lima campus. Furthermore, I've also realized the influence of higher education and how it affects each of us. Most students, including myself, begin their college careers under the impression that they are there to receive a degree and then advance in their actual careers. However, a college experience is more than receiving a degree. The college experience is also there to transform the way we perceive ourselves and the world around us. This research project has transformed the way I perceive my college experience. Personally, I chose to attend the Ohio State University at Lima because of my struggles with social anxiety and being around large groups of people, as well as being able to be close to the support of my family and friends. Nevertheless, this, this research project gave me the opportunity to push myself out of my comfort zone and transform the way I approach social interaction. I've become more grateful for every opportunity offered to me, and I realize now I can positively influence others through my own actions. I would like to end my presentation with a quote from Dr. Violet Meek. As she stated in her interview, I think the regional campuses are a light on the edge of the prairie. If young people and not so young ones could find us, if they came to the campus, they would find other people who were as bright as they were whose light shone, people who talked about ethics and meant it, who talked about beauty and recognized it. 
It was our job to make them, maybe for the first time, feel at home. I'm one of those students. Hundreds of people in Allen County and surrounding counties are that student. And as a student and a person, I want to personally thank these women and others on the Lima campus for their absolute dedication to the Ohio State University at Lima and the students who go there. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Sean. I use they them pronouns and today I'd like to talk to you about prejudice in Western philosophy. So, um, oops, sorry, my keyboard is uh, not cooperating here. Um, so, I'd like to start off, I seem to have missed up my the screen of my order. Okay, so, I'd like to start off by talking to you about um, how Western philosophers define philosophy. So, according to Dr. James Matthew, Western philosophers define philosophy as something that you do, which is questioning your implicit worldview. And this is contrasted with having philosophy or having an implicit worldview. Um, now, you might be tempted to agree with those sort of uh, basic definitions, but in addition to these, um, Western philosophers define doing philosophy as something that is active, orderly, questioning, ethical, scientific, religious, or masculine and Western, whereas having philosophy is the exact opposite of those things. Um, and looking at this, you might be tempted correctly to dispute all of the terms that are on that list. Um, but in particular, you might be uh, objecting strongly to the last three, right? Is it, the fact being non-Western does not mean that you can't question your beliefs, right? And Dr. Matthew would happen to agree with that. And he gives two options for how one might respond to it. So the first option is to argue that the dichotomy has been misapplied to a specific person or group. This is what Dr. Matthew does. He does it on behalf of the Aztecs. He argues that even though the Aztecs were not Western, they were still capable of doing philosophy and they did it quite well. And we can imagine that a feminist philosopher might say, well, just because something is feminine does not make it philosophical. And just because something is masculine does not make it, it does not make it philosophical. Um, but the second option, which is my approach, is to argue that the dichotomy between having and doing philosophy and all those terms is in itself an arcane relic of Western bias. And so in order to do this, I asked myself um, a series of research questions. Those are, when did the dichotomy originate? And when did the dichotomy become infused with prejudice sentiment? And to answer this question, I have um, essentially made a giant timeline um, where I track developments in bias, whether it's um, uh, sexist or ethnophobic over time, and then I compare it across per different periods, and then I have a different timeline where I compare developments in the field of philosophy. And so let's talk about what I found. We'll start with the first philosopher, Pythagoras. Pythagoras founded a religious cult in southern Italy called Croton, and he was the first person to use the, use the term philosophy. And he defined philosophy as loving skill. And he contrasted this with having skill, which he referred to as sophistry. Now, that is somewhat similar to what Western philosophers define philosophy to be, right? Because having skill and loving skill, uh, loving skill is definitively the more active version. Um, but beyond that, there aren't a whole lot of similarities. Pythagoras calls sophistry businesslike, cunning, and trained, whereas philosophy is meditative, untrained and not business-like. You can't do philosophy with profit. And in a way, that's kind of the opposite of what modern Western philosophers do, right? Because if something is business-like or trained, it's probably gonna be more orderly, which is what modern philosophers define philosophy to be. 
And in addition, Pythagoras does not make any sort of uh, claims about uh, religious feminine or non-Western people being able to do philosophy. So even though this is analogous to what modern day philosophers call the dichotomy, it's not prejudiced in the same way. For that, we're gonna have to look forward to a man named Plato. Um, Plato was a student of his more famous teacher, Socrates, and he metaphorically defined doing philosophy as letting your soul fly. Now, what exactly does that mean? For that, we're gonna consult this painting by Raphael. Um, the figure that's outlined in red is actually Plato. And if you can see, one of his hands is pointing upward toward the sky. And the reason that he's doing that is because Plato thought that the world around us is not reality. Reality and truth exist somewhere above us in the heavens, in the sun, um, somewhere outside of our earthly experience. And so doing philosophy is letting your soul or your intellect fly into that realm where the divine truths are. Um, but that begs the question, who exactly is capable of letting their soul fly? Who has a winged soul and who does not? So Plato argued that in order to have a winged soul, you had to have a balance between an erotic disposition and a phlegmatic disposition. An erotic disposition means that you're passionate, combative, you're skilled in dialogue, and Plato associates this with Western and European people. And a phlegmatic disposition means that you're disciplined, technically skilled, and he associate and intelligent, and he associates this with being Eastern or Asian. Um, and as you might expect, he has a very specific idea about who most commonly has a balance between these two things. And that would be Greek people. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, that would be Greek people. And so now we are dealing with something that is much more similar to what modern philosophers do, right? Having an unwinged soul is passive. It's unimpressive, unquestioning, and it's not Greek. Whereas doing philosophy or having a winged soul is active, impressive, questioning, and ethical. And the, there's a great de degree of similarity between these other terms too. Um, the slight differences are that Plato doesn't think that philosophy is something that's necessarily orderly. It's kind of the opposite. He thinks that philosophy is something that's sudden and spontaneous. It's a eureka moment um, rather than being something that's orderly. And secondly, he doesn't think that philosophy is an essentially masculine thing. He thinks that it is a balance between masculine and feminine. It just so happens that only his fellow Greeks possess this. Um, and subsequently, he doesn't think that Western people are uniquely capable of philosophy. He thinks that Greek people are. But in spite of those differences, um, we would still consider this to be very similar to the modern day dichotomy between who can and cannot have philosophy, right? Um, partially because we, looking back, would consider the ancient Greeks part of the West, right? And so, what exactly happened here? How did we get from Pythagoras, who invented the dichotomy, to Plato, who infused it with all of these prejudices? The answer comes in the form of a man named Hippocrates. Hippocrates lived slightly before Plato, and he's famous for separating med medicine from religion. And one of the things that he argues is that there's a division in the world that exists between Europe and the West and Asia or the East. Europeans are poor, physically strong, mentally undisciplined, unintelligent, very free because they can't form governments. They're hyper-masculine and they have a choleric or an erotic disposition. Whereas Asians in the East are rich, physically weak, mentally disciplined or intelligent. Um, they're slavish um, because they, can't, they don't know how to fight for themselves. And they're very feminine and they have that phlegmatic disposition that Plato was talking about. So this is where these biases first are articulated on record, right? You might have noticed that very conspicuously, Hippocrates doesn't actually have anything to say about Greece um, and where that might fit into this. Um, for that, we'll have to go flash forward a few hundred years, a hundred years to Aristotle. Aristotle adds to Hippocrates' theories by introducing Greece as the perfect medium. It has all of the good qualities of the, of the West and all the good qualities of the East, but none of the bad qualities. So Greeks are both combative and spirited and intelligent and disciplined. 
And so um, that is where the modern day version of the dichotomy takes its earliest form. And um, so going back to my original research questions, when did the dichotomy originate? The dichotomy itself originated with Pythagoras in the archaic period at the very latest, right? And when did the dichotomy become infused with prejudice sentiment? Classical period in Athens at the very latest. And so when Dr. James Nappy is talking about prejudice against Aztec and native people in general, and he sets up this great distinction between people who can and can't do philosophy, classical Greece is the first place that that comes into fruition, right? And it includes a division between uh, feminine and masculine peoples, imbalances of gender, and a sort of ethnic argument about who can and can't do philosophy. And I'll leave you with uh, an abbreviated version of my sources. I picked the four that have the like most clear overview of all of my research. And um, with that, I thank you for uh, attending this presentation. Hi, everyone. Let me just do a quick little screen share. Lovely. All right. Hi, uh, I'm Katherine Watson, and I'm a senior here at the Ohio State University uh, studying English literature. So when I had started this research fellowship, I had intended on working um, on tracing the enemies to lovers trope throughout its literary history. So I was really gonna like start with Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen as my guiding work and go from there. Um, I was gonna really focus on 19th century literature, which means that I had really been excited to spend my summer hanging out in Thompson Library and at Billy Ireland going through like old archives. But obviously with COVID and lockdown, those plans shifted a fair bit. However, uh, they still seem to be on the same track until I attended a discussion that was hosted by our English department about Pride and Prejudice. Um, and I listened to the thoughts of Professor Claire Simmons and Jameson Cantor about how Elizabeth first falls in love with Darcy in Pride and Prejudice when confronted with an image of him. So this made me really think about love and how it can form at a distance. So. That was really in my mind as we were living through lockdown, like what does distance do to a budding romance? Uh, does it matter? And then we were really properly off to the races. So love at a distance as a trope can be seen in Much Ado About Nothing and The Taming of the Shrew by Shakespeare, uh, most memorably in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And then also I have noticed it in popular contemporary romance fiction, such as Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, great read, highly recommend. Um, and in addition to keeping a blog to document my research process, I also did a lot of citation tracing, uh, which is where you go into the bibliographies of like every academic paper you could find and just dig until you can't dig anymore. Um, so the biggest part of this project for me was, um, well, at least like the newest and most difficult was learning how to code a text, which is, just as weird and as strange as it sounds. Um, using a program called InVivo, I coded the instances of interaction between Elizabeth and Darcy. And I was looking for the objective statistics of their relationship, trying to get like a different perspective on literature. So I coded for a wide variety of concepts, which you can see here. Um, so including moments where attraction was alluded to, negative and or positive comments made about each other together and separately to other people uh, and a bunch of other things. So this was super interesting to do and by far the most like eye-opening part of this project for me, because in my experience with studying literature, it is very much a thing that is based on feelings and compassion with characters. So seeing the cold, hard facts before me was just a whole new way of looking at the story that I'd read like a thousand times. Um, when you get to know Mr. Darcy from this perspective, the perspective that Lizzie gives you and that our main perspective is, you hear that he is the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world and everybody hoped that he would never come there again. So when you come into the story with that perspective, you would assume that he's going to be the one perpetrating a lot of the insults and rudeness in the relationship. 
which is why my most important statistical finding was that the discrepancy between angry or dismissive comments delivered by Lizzie versus Darcy is pretty sizable. Um, and Elizabeth leads by a not insignificant portion. So she's actually kind of mean to him. Um, this is super interesting because Elizabeth's main gripe with Darcy is how rude he is and how like he insults her and her family. And I never would have noticed that she does an awful lot of the same thing without this distance reading tool. Um, and this is a lot to do with how literature works because we get the story from Lizzie's perspective. Um, we go through the text operating under the assumption that Lizzie is a reliable narrator and is delivering at least a semi unbiased account of the interactions between her and Mr. Darcy. So therefore, when she tells us that Darcy is rude and is besmirching her and her family for no reason, even though she's being fairly pleasant, we're going to believe her. This data, which is uninfluenced by our Elizabeth Bennet sympathies, is saying something different. Um, of course, this also has to be seen through the lens that we do read the story through Lizzie's point of view by spending more time in her head than we do anywhere near Darcy's person for much of the novel. It is expected that we would hear a wide variety of things from her, including just like her rude mean thoughts that she's having. So if we were in Darcy's head, we might be finding that he's having just as intense a stream of disparagement through his head about Lizzie and her embarrassing family, something he actually does say. Um, however, this data does show that Lizzie is not as blameless in the interactions between them as she would lead, with, lead us to believe. So in regards to the initial question that I had about distance and romance, um, in the cases I looked at, the lack of proximity to between two characters forming a relationship is actually essential to the formation of the relationship. Um, it is only when Elizabeth is not eye to eye with Darcy that she is able to have this emotional distance that she needs to really reconsider this hard stance that she's taken on him and who he is and whether she wants anything to do with him. Um, when you see someone without really seeing them, so whether that be if you're looking at a painting of them or reading a letter that they wrote you, you can believe whatever you want about them. Um, you set the tone and the framework of this conversation because it really is just a one-way conversation that you are having with your idea of a person. And if they had spoken in person and Darcy had delivered his diatribe specifically in his letter that he writes to her to her face, she might have had a totally different experience. Who knows what tone was intended when he wrote that. He could have been actually like really being rude, just like she has so often heard and disliked from him when he talked to her. However, because it's just her, she is able to create a fantasy about who Darcy is. She creates this ability to believe something about Darcy and ignore flaws that if you were in person, you wouldn't be able to ignore or overlook. Um, and this may sound like a negative, but it is actually quite positive. Um, this gives characters that may be hard-headed, aka Elizabeth, um, a way to look at things without the biases that they initially come into the narrative with. So in addition, uh, in, a, in addition to your typical formal paper, I also created a story map to make this idea coherent and accessible. So we'll do a fun little scroll through. Um, I won't read anything out loud to you, but I will pop the link to this in the chat after we are done with this. Um, mostly, I just really wanted to showcase how cool this platform is. Um, it's called ArcGIS Story Maps, and it is a super easy way of creating digital content in a not boring fashion as a little spice. Um, so I think I'll probably be using it for resumes and such. It's just very accessible, very easy to use, and I'm not sponsored, but I should be. I do recommend it. Um, so I'm continuing with my research this semester. Uh, with an independent study run by, um, advised by Jen Schnabel, hey Jen, love you, um, and I'm taking bits from the work that I did this summer about love at a distance, and I am integrating it into my initial idea of the enemies to lovers trope. Um, some of the novels that I'm working with right now include some of Charlotte Brame's work. Brame was a popular Victorian fiction writer. Uh, Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery, and Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, which is kind of a queer retelling of Pride and Prejudice in a way. Uh, I'm going to be working on, in addition to a comprehensive paper, another story map that's kind of in the same vein as the one that I just showed you about Pride and Prejudice. Um, so that's all I have. I wanted to especially thank our librarians um, 
I can only imagine the logistical like switcheroo that you had to pull when COVID happened and it looked like fellowships weren't going to happen at all. But this has been just such an incredible academic experience. And I know I wouldn't have been able to have it anywhere else but at OSU or with you guys. So thank you so much for all the work that you've done and thank you to everyone else for listening. My name is Danny Wallerman. Hi, my name is Danny Wallerman. I am a third year student who is majoring in international studies with a specialization in development. I also have a minor in studio art in Arabic. Uh, and I'm here today to tell you about my summer project. I researched the female refugee experience in central Ohio. And I did this through interviews with women um, with female refugees in the central Ohio area. Um, I did this over the phone, of course, um, but I talked to six different women, uh, all from different countries. And I also uh, did a lot of preliminary research, including reading a lot of different books, um, watching documentaries, um, looking at other studies, that kind of thing. Um, and then with my project, I created well, with all that information, I created this project, a uh, scalar project in which I use like a mixture of video and text um, and images um, to explain um, the, the circumstances that these women face. So I split my information into three groups. In the introduction, I go over methodology, background, um, what it, needs to research uh, during summer of 2020 uh, in relation to the coronavirus in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I also give a trigger warning um, just in case some of you are um, need to be aware of this. There's a lot of um, information about or graphic depictions of sexual violence, um, gender-based violence, that kind of thing um, that I feel is important to tell you about before I continue. Um, and in part one, I first I introduce who I've spoken to, their ages, um, where they're from, that kind of thing. Generally, the women I talked to were older, around, they were mostly in their 40s. Um, but yeah, so I spoke to women from Bhutan, Iraq, Cambodia, Algeria, Eritrea, and Rwanda. And I'm just gonna share a couple of interesting facts. Um, I can, uh, I came across when I was researching them um, because here I'll give like the basic historical overview um, and then I'll go into more detail about the women from that country. So one interesting thing I found was that Iraq, um, the situation for women worsened after the US invasion in 2003. Women's rights were better under Saddam Hussein than they are now. Um, and this was confirmed by the one woman I talked to from Iraq. Um, she experienced this. Um, and it's mainly due to instability, which was what put a lot of women in danger um, in the various countries I studied. Um, another interesting one was Eritrea, where um, they were, so Eritrea was uh, colonized multiple times by the British, by Italians, and then by Ethiopia. Um, and they fought for their independence and uh, women were a huge part of that fight. Um, they were seen almost as equal to men um, with their contributions. Um, but after that was over and they had established a new government, women weren't given the same treatment. They were expected to go back into their roles as wives and mothers. Um, and that was a really hard transition. And um, now, Unfortunately, uh, it's turned into a dictatorship and um, women are uh, severely oppressed under it, um, including forced military service um, that young women have to, well, everybody has to um, go to, but 
young women have to go where they are often abused um, and don't come back to their families because this is indefinite service. So they can decide how long you have to serve for. Another interesting case was Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda had um, a genocide uh, that a lot of um, a lot of men and women were killed. It was um, it created a imbalance in the population. So there was a majority of women and there were less men. Um, so that contributed to um, the situation they have today, where um, after the genocide, they elected uh, Kagame to be their president. And he really promoted women's rights. They have a majority women parliament. Uh, but this is all like at the top level. They kind of took a top down approach um, to women's rights. And um, on the ground level, people's attitudes haven't changed about the role of women. So women in society are still seen as um, wives and mothers and girls are still expected to do the house work and to put boys education before their own. And um, the girl I talked to from Rwanda who was around my age, she re reiterated this to me. Um, and what was kind of surprising to me because I, I thought with um, a woman parliament, um, a lot of leaders are women. Um, I thought that would have a bigger impact, but it's needed a lot at the grassroots level. And then um, in part two, I go over the major themes um, that uh, were present throughout all the research. I also go through the different books I um, I read for this project. A couple of my favorites were The Girl Who Smiled Beads, this one, um, and uh, How Dare the Sunrise. Um, this is probably, my, it's like my favorite book now. Um, it was very relevant to this project. This girl's, um, her experiences like echoed a lot of the stuff I heard. Um, it just, and it gave me a lot of insight into gender roles um, between the US and the country she came from. Um, so again, I cover, I found these basic themes. Um, I use deduce to code my information. And um, these are the major ones that um, I came up with to code for. Um, and I invite you to go through each of these, um, mainly with education. The more education you have, the better off you are. Women um, have a lot of barriers to education, money, culture, that kind of thing. Mental health, a lot of the women um, suffer from mental health issues because of the trauma they've experienced and then they don't get adequate care. With the American dream, um, families uh, expect that if they work hard, they can make it here, they can survive when that's not the case. You need a lot more things. Um, working hard doesn't guarantee you success in a stable life. Um, just generals in general, what um, have women been assigned to do? Um, what does their role in the family look like? Um, that kind of thing. And that is the conclusion of my project, but it was just to start. I, it only made, it didn't like clear the story up for me. It made it more complicated. Um, there's a lot of different aspects to how um, their lives have been shaped the experiences in the US, the experiences in their home country, um, how being a woman affects it. It's, it's a lot more complicated than when you first look at it. And there are a couple topics I didn't get to cover in detail um, that I really wanna look further into. One of them is colonialism. Every country I looked at uh, was colonized and every, like every time somewhere was colonized, destabilization followed. Um, and I would like to look more into the effects that had on these countries and then specifically how that affected women. Um, religion also played a really big role. 
women um, were really religious. Most of the women I talked to, um, the major religions being Christianity and Islam, um, and just how that can lift women up, but also the it can tear women down. Um, and it would be interesting to go more into that. Um, and finally, looking at, I would want to look at solutions where I could see the policies that have been um, put in place to better uh, the situations like in education, mental health, that kind of thing, and see how successful they were in other countries and try to figure out if they could work for the US and the um, refugees we have in central Ohio. Um, so yeah, that is my project. I invite you to please go through it. I have lots of videos. Um, I go really in depth into the history of these countries. Um, uh, so yeah, I invite you to go through it. If you have any questions, you can contact me at wallerman.6 at osu.edu and that's W-O-L-L-E-R-M-A-N. Um, yeah, please enjoy. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so I just uh, wanted to start. Um, I have everything written down, so just one sec. Okay, well, hi, everyone. I'm June Beavers, uh, and I'd like to start by saying that I am immensely proud that I could be a part of last summer's undergraduate research library fellowship at OSU. And uh, before I get too into the nitty gritty details of my research, I'd like to take a moment to uh, thank the selection committee for allowing me to take part in this fellowship, as well as my research mentor, Hannah Primo, without whom I would have been supremely lost. Um, also, congratulations and well done to my fellow fellows. We all worked very hard in our research and I'm thrilled to have heard all of your final thoughts. Uh, lastly, thank you all for being here today. It was a long and complicated journey, but I'm happy to finally be able to share my thoughts and work with you. Just for some additional background, I'm a fourth year student at OSU. Um, I'm pre preparing to graduate in May with my bachelor's in creative writing and more specifically poetry. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that I've been happily working in OSUL since uh, my freshman year and the passion for library work that I've cultivated has only been intensified with, with the practice I gained through this opportunity. So to uh, blend my passions for libraries and po poetry, I decided to take on, in my view, a persistent problem for undergraduate poets. Uh, the problem that is of a lack of groups and resources through which undergraduates can engage meaningfully with their peers uh, to write, read, compare, and improve their own and others' poetry. Uh, the essential questions that I kept in mind throughout the research proce process uh, were these. Uh, what are the limitations that keep students of poetry from engaging with communities of their peers, and how can I help to minimize them? Even with that essential question in mind, the primary goals of my project since almost the beginning have been something of a moving target. Uh, originally, I had intended to engage in community building, uh, directly by focusing my efforts on the spoken word and how important that voice is for young poets, especially college students. I also intended to create a collection of stu student poetry to be made accessible through the OSU OSUL website, but due mainly to a lack of interest, I instead uh, chose to focus on undergraduate com community building in general rather than publication. Uh, the Ohio State University has an excellent creative writing program, but it has uh, one major shortcoming. And that's the lack of available communities of peers and resources for its students outside of academia. In a classroom setting, students learn to engage with their peers, uh, with their and their peers' work in a workshop situation. And though this program undoubtedly educates and prepares students to recognize and improve their writing processes, what it does not do is engage these students with a larger, non academically focused community of poets. As something of a salve to this problem, I wished to host poetry open mics in Columbus in the surrounding area so that I could record and collect as much as I needed. 
Uh, the current circumstances, however, made this impossible. So instead, I began to reach out to poets of all walks of life, both to collect written work and to set up interviews to discuss topics varying from the contemporary traditions of spoken word poetry in Columbus to the prevalent modes and topics of poetry among OSU undergraduates. The most useful product of this research is without a doubt a series of three interviews that I conducted with the ultimate purpose of understanding how communities of poets form, how they conduct themselves, and what hurdles stand in the way of these communities being formed on our campus. To gather as much useful information as possible, I reached out to four poets I know well whom have, who have, whom have been involved in various communities of poets around the area in several capacities. Ah, sorry, I meant to show that slide beforehand. Um, first, I interviewed two poets who are not currently students, but have been involved with the Columbus poetry community for nearly a decade, Sprout Reed and Hannah Bundy. Uh, the information they provided was incredibly useful to this research, especially since neither of them had actually been engaged with poetry in an academic setting since high school. I learned many things, but the most important takeaway from the interview was that Columbus has, and has had for a while now, an extremely vibrant, diverse, and welcoming group community of spoken word poets. This community is perfect for young poets who need a crash course in the culture of poetry and what separates a good spoken word poem from a bad one. As they said, performance is every, everything to dedicated Columbus poets. And regardless of how well written a piece of poetry is, your performance of the piece must stand on more than the ink on the page. When asked what makes a good performance, Sprout and Hannah gave me a fairly obvious answer, practice. On a surface level, I had a partial answer to my question then. Undergraduates, even those among the creative writing majors and minors at OSU, myself included, oftentimes lack performance experience. In my second interview, I needed some perfect perspective on this lack of experience, so I went to someone just as inexperienced as myself, a fellow creative writing major and undergraduate poet, Jasper Jazz Graydon. I chose to inter interview Jazz for a number of reasons. I've been in an academic poetry work workshop with, her, uh, with them, and we're both concentrating in poetry. However, we both tend to utilize, utilize narrative elements in interesting, challenging ways that speak to our interesting, challenging position in the world as people who do not identify with the tra traditional gender binary or adhere to prescribed sexualities. Through the discourses that both Jazz and I initiated and engaged with in class, I also knew that we were both aware of our privilege as white poets, that we both valued valued as many different perspectives as possible and that at every opportunity we were both eager to hear learn from and lift up our peers of color that is to say i chose to speak with jazz specifically because i could reliably say that more than most other people we were capable of relating to each other's experiences as undergraduate poets in our workshops together jazz also never failed to give me detailed actionable, fe actionable feedback on my work that not only guided my edits but challenged me to think more deeply about how, what, and why my poetry was written. It was my hope that in their interview, they would not only help me to come to a clearer answer, but that they would raise questions and push, push me to reconsider what a community of undergraduate poets should look like and for what purpose. By these metrics, we, ha we had an extremely productive conversation. The most significant outcome of Jazz and I's conversation was a better, more specific understanding of how an undergraduate community of poets on campus would be most beneficial not just to creative writing students, but to other students and members of the community as well. Together, we built a vision for, community, for a community on campus, led by and for students of poetry, specifically for the purpose of practicing and discussing how best to transition from being an academically focused poet to a community focused one. When I had my third interview with Professor Kathy Fagan, Professor of Poetry and Director of Creative Writing at OSU, I was surprised to find out that the more specific under, understanding of a peer community that Jazz helped me come to was something that the creative writing staff had been trying to get, get together for years. She was in total agreement that if there were to be an undergraduate community of poets at OSU, this community needed to serve not only its students, but the wider community of Columbus as well. While centered on undergraduate work, it would also, it would also be imperative for as diverse a cast of, of people as possible to be involved so that these students gain experience in every aspect of writing and performing poetry. After discussing how this community could be built within the university system while being detached from the creative writing program and connected to the larger Columbus poetry scene, 
I mentioned to Dr. Fagan that my original idea was to host an open mic geared toward young poets, originally at a local coffee shop, but when that fell through at one of the OSU libraries. She then went on to tell me that in all of the scenarios she had thought about where this peer community would meet, the libraries had always seemed most attractive, simply because of the fact that, as I discussed with Jazz, this community would need to take up residence somewhere in between academia and the, largest, the larger Columbus community. Libraries themselves stand as a gateway into academic knowledge, but at their most basic elements, they provide valuable and necessary resources to any community they are present in. And since the OSU libraries serve so many students and community members alike, it would be foolish not to take adva full advantage of that intersection. So through these interviews, I cultivated an idea of what an active, responsible, and transitionary community for undergraduate poets should look like in order to minimize limitations to access and maximize the potential for the acquisition of quality community-based experience and education in the culture and practice of poetry. The artifacts I produced as a result of this research will un undoubtedly be useful for my future endeavors, and I hope that as soon as I am able, I can make these transcripts and pieces of pieces of poetry freely available for students, professors, and community members with an interest in poetry. This community should be, as indicated by my conversation with Sprout and Hannah, mainly experiential. But as I discussed with Jazz and Dr. Fagan, it also needs to be geared toward engaging undergraduate poets with the disciplines of spoken and written poetry through practices that they are already familiar with, such as utilizing workshop formats, craft readings, and maybe even guest speakers. Each of these practices should also be adapted to helping them build confidence in their work, gain the community-based experience they lack, and more than anything, feel prepared to enter the outside world of poetry. As Professor Fagan said, there is no better institution su suited to providing, providing this community than the libraries, just because just like the experience that undergraduate poets need to gain, the libraries have always stood at the corner of academia and community. Uh, thank you. There's a funny picture of my dog if you're about that. Thank you to all of our presenters and our mentors. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentations like I did. Um, I knew what everyone was working on, but this is the first time I saw the finished products and I am very impressed. So right now we are going to the Q&A and I'll ask if you have questions, you can pop them into this box here. Um, I'll read them aloud. Uh, Rachel Parisi, not a question, but kudos to these talented undergraduates who produced amazing research this summer, despite the limitations of COVID-19. I couldn't agree more. Um, that is, absolutely true and um, we're really proud of the students so thank you for putting that in the q a box rachel um, we have a question from oh rachel stewart um, one of our uh, wonderful english department grad students has a question for catherine uh, so catherine get ready um, rachel asks do you think that this love at a distance phenomena is married to the form of the novel or of literature in general, as opposed to something like a film or graphic novel? Or alternatively, how would you posit that perhaps a change in form would cause a change in this trope? And then she says, great presentation and fascinating work. So Catherine. Hey, thanks Rachel. Um, so I think that's a super interesting question. I think that Love at a Distance as like a narrative topic is going to explode, um, especially after we've all been like locked down or all hanging out at home. Um, I think it's super interesting that it could be in literally any category. Um, for instance, like if you, I like, God, there's so many ways it could be done. Um, you could do stuff with like emails and text messages um, through like a graphic novel or through a movie. There's just a zillion ways that it can be done um, and done well. Uh, and a change in form will cause a change in this trope. Um, the most interesting thing about it is that it really doesn't change between like change in form. It's still the same like concept. I, I'm trying to think of a love at a distance narrative in like a movie, but I can't think of one right now, but it can work for like a historical topic or a present day. For instance, like Pride and Prejudice, the love at a distance that you're working with was more like looking at paintings of Darcy and then reading letters that are exchanged 
obviously things that are not 21st century items. Um, but for instance, red, white, and royal blue, a lot of these conversations are happening via like FaceTime or phone calls or text messages. Um, text messages especially, I think, are a super interesting way of looking at it because of how fast it is and how much it is like a real conversation and the accessibility of that. So I look forward to seeing all of like the, the love at a distance content that's going to be coming out in the next few years after our like eight month home vacation. So yeah, thank you, Rachel. Anybody else have questions? I have a question for all of the panelists, um, if you wouldn't mind answering. Uh, what is the discovery that surprised you the most during the course of your research this summer? Um, why don't we um, Why don't we start with Mia? Hey everyone, um, thank you for asking that question. There was a lot of surprises, I think, throughout this process. Um, Dr. Bond can attest of how many surprises and just research process I had to deal with. Um, I have never had a long-term research project like this before. And to be honest, the first few weeks, I was like, what am I doing? I feel like I'm not like, producing anything. I'm just you know, surrounded by stuff, surrounded by who knows what. Um, and I wasn't able to fully sort of see the big picture um, until much later. And, you know, Dr. Bonds was just like, this is how research does not know where it takes you until you see all your data in front of you and you're like, oh, this is what it's all forming. So that was one of the biggest surprises in research specifically that I found just in the research process. But in terms of the actual content of what I found, I think that I don't know if I was surprised um, at how prevalent anti-rape activism was at OSU, um, or rather just the scope of it. Um, you know, because anti-rape activists, um, we have the rape um, education prevention program. That's the only reason why we have it in the first place, um, because we had um, anti-rape activists. We have the cabs buses. We have lights on the oval. Um, you don't have to pay for the cabs buses to get on it. So all of these things that I think. OSU promotes is just like, oh, like we have these, like these are just conveniences. Um, I think their origin in political activism is often erased. And I found that a really interesting thing because you wouldn't necessarily think that buses on campus were so radical at the time. You wouldn't think that lights on the oval were so radical at the time. Um, and I think that it only pushes me further for the anti rape activism I do currently. Um, that my asks maybe 20 years from now will not be as radical, will be common sense. So I think that it is very uplifting that through the, my research, I was able to find all of these progresses that have been made. So that was really surprising and really hopeful. Thank you, Mia. Hannah? So I guess I was really surprised at how, just how much the women on um, the Ohio State Lima campus have done. I've only, you know, I was born in 1998. So a lot of these women were working during the time when, you know, I wasn't even conscious of what was going on. So I was surprised at just how like connected our history is. Like I, like I'm personally affected by how Dr. Meek has brought majors to the Lima campus and I don't know, that was what surprised me the most, I guess. So. Yeah. Uh, Sean. Uh, um, a lot of what I found surprised me. Um, every time you hear a famous philosopher saying that only people that are exactly like them can do what they do is, you know, it, it never gets less surprising. Um, but one thing in particular that surprised me for its similarity, similarity of today has to do with trade. Um, Plato, um, bizarrely, in one of his dialogues says that trade should only benefit Greece. When Greece trades with someone that's not Greek, it should only be a one-way benefit. No one else should be able to benefit from it. And then um, uh, a, a later Roman author, I think it might have been Livy or Plutarch says, oh, we, or the Roman empire loses uh, hundreds of millions of sesterces, their, their currency, to India, China, and Arabia every year. 
And uh, the reason that these things surprise me is that uh, in the ancient world, no one collected trade analytics. So they are literally making up these numbers out of nowhere to justify their, their uh, prejudice against people who are not like them. And as I was reading that, I just had sudden flashes of Donald Trump saying very similar things about trade deficits with anyone, but especially China. Um, and uh, it's <laughs> even today, um, trade deficits don't actually, I'm not going to get into a whole rant, um, but that's just the most bizarrely strange thing that I came across. Thank you, Sean. Catherine. Uh, definitely what Mia said about the sheer like mass of like things that are available to you. I think as undergraduate students, we never really get the opportunity to have a full blown research project. Um, I don't want to speak for everyone, but at least for me, a lot of research projects that we do in the classroom is more of like a panicked like race to the finish and less of a like sitting in the information and like marinating in it and learning more about it just for the sake of learning versus like just desperately trying to get something on the page. Um, I wish that everyone could have this opportunity like this, this like fellowship made me fall in love with higher education again. Um, it like the opportunity to truly just learn just for the sake of like learning and like expanding um, was incredible. Also, uh, the quantitative analysis of literature is a perspective that I had never thought of doing before. And just like in vivo and coding stuff, never thought of it. So the way that it totally changes the perspective was fascinating for me and something I'll definitely be utilizing as I move forward. Thank you, Catherine. Danny. Yeah, um, I totally agree with what Catherine said, uh, being able to use um, different qualitative um, data like sorters, that kind of thing. Um, I had never known how to do that before this project. So it was very um, cool and surprising to see the different ways I could utilize those sources. And another thing that surprised me was um, the difficulty I had in recruiting uh, people to interview. I expected that it would be a little hard, um, but the added um, restrictions from COVID made it a little harder. Um, our political circumstances, um, I was doing the bulk of my interviews uh, right around um, the death of George Floyd. So there was a lot of like political tension, um, just a combination of all that made it harder to um, recruit people. But yeah, that was a little surprising to me, but yeah. Thank you, Danny. Uh, finally, June. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I had not really a lot of, I wasn't expecting to have much quantitative data going into this, and I definitely didn't. Um, and I think what probably surprised me the most about this whole process was just how much my research actually changed as it went. Um, because I, I originally had started off wanting to do open mics, and then for obvious reasons, that wasn't going to work out. And then I was trying to uh, collect work uh, just from other students um, online, and I didn't really get too much response from that. So I was actually surprised that I ended up spending so much time doing these interviews and, uh, and talking with people just about how a community of uh, student poets would even work right now. Um, and yeah, I, I just had a lot of really interesting things to talk about with a lot of really interesting people. And uh, I'm happy with, with what I ended up with, but I, uh, I'm definitely going to keep working at it when I have the time and uh, try to make it a more complete finished product. Um, but until then, I'm, I'm hoping that I or, or somebody who's heard this uh, can use what I, what I just talked about um, in building a better student poet organization on campus. And uh, yeah, it was just, I had a great time doing it um, because, uh, you know, libraries and and poetry, those are pretty much my two big like passions. And uh, it's definitely uh, made me more, um, 
resolute to go to to go into grad school for library science. So I just really appreciate this whole opportunity. Thanks so much, June. Thank add, you. I'm oh, sorry, Sean. Go ahead. If I could add something um, to this whole uh, topic of like how our projects changed over time and the question of qualitative analysis. Um, I, my project, I didn't really, I was looking for the first moments that things occurred rather than trying to, to, to quantify how much something has happened over a long period of time. But uh, even though I wasn't um, coming at it from the same angle as the rest of, uh, of the rest of these presenters, I still had to learn how to code things in a way um, in, in Microsoft Excel. Uh, I only flashed my timeline very briefly, but uh, there's such just such a gargantuan amount of even condensed information that um, you need to have like a sort of heuristic to like quickly sort out what you want to find. And that's not something that I've ever had to do before because in, in, S, in most like in high school and even in so far in college, um, most of the essays that we write, we kind of know what we're going to argue beforehand. And so it's very, you don't need to search for contrary evidence. And like, if it doesn't relate to your argument, you don't have it in your work. And so I think that's the most different. I started out and I was just trying to write my essay um, without having had the evidence, but then I kept finding things that contradicted it. And so I had to kind of relearn how to do research in a way that's similar yet different to what the rest of uh, everyone else was doing. Uh, and so I just wanted to say that I'm I'm glad that everyone went through a similar, if um, somewhat different experience. Thanks, Sean. We do have a question in the Q&A box. Um, Sarah Stauffer Lurch, uh, this question is for any of the wonderful researchers. How did you go from potentially having several different avenues of research questions at the beginning of your respective projects to ultimately narrowing it down to what you ended up focusing on? That is the age old question for researchers. So who would like to take that first? Uh, I can. Um, I, uh, I knew that I wanted to do something uh, in poetry just because that's what I'm studying right now. Um, and obviously, um, I had a lot of different things uh, to choose from. And I guess th the reason that I ultimately went with uh, just trying to build a framework for how to build like a student poet organization that's community oriented, um, I only came onto that because uh, originally I was going to collect work and try to um, find, uh, like identify and analyze particular practices or, or themes of poetry among undergraduates. Um, but I, I quickly figured out that I wasn't gonna have um, enough to work with for that. Um, and that it wasn't really getting, just, just doing that collection wouldn't really have gotten to the heart of my uh, essential question anyway, which was, you know, how do I, help students, uh, how can I do that um, in this sort of capacity? And so what I ultimately came to uh, was narrowing it down from making a bunch of resources and uh, potential uh, and lists of potential groups and things like that for students to get more involved in poetry um, on campus. And instead of just you know, cataloging and doing all that and itemizing all of those things, I decided that it would be best to take up a new idea of what that organization would look like. And I'm, I'm really happy with what I ended up with. So yeah, that was a great question. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Could go what, or go next, anybody else? That's good. Um, so I narrowed down my topic by looking where I thought data was missing um, in academia. Uh, you don't generally have a lot of data about refugees and then female refugees even more. Um, and I also knew I wanted to focus on women, whatever um, avenue I went down. Uh, and then I wanted to make sure I was hearing the perspectives and what people want um, from who I'm researching. 
Uh, so all those things help me narrow everything down. Thanks, Danny. Who else wants to add? Hannah. Um, I, my experience was similar to Danny's. I knew I wanted to do a project that would add something to the Lima campus um, and also be centered around women and celebrating them. And so when I was talking with Tina, we're like, well, the Lima archives, we're building it up. Tina is, and she's doing a fantastic job at it. And, um, and it's like, we have, she had two oral histories done beforehand with women who had graduated from the Lima campus the, that were the first graduating class. And um, kind of just wanted to take that and up it up one of it and do like the administrators and faculty and staff members and, um, and add to the Knowledge Bank and the Voices of Women project voices um, from the Lima campus that, you know, weren't getting the attention that they deserved. And I see the similarity there and it's really cool. But I also wanted to say that I loved all your presentations and you all have done such great work and I really appreciate listening to them. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Mia? Yeah, um, thank you, Hannah. I really enjoyed everyone's presentation, so I'm really glad I got to be here. Um, one of the things that I found really difficult, I think I just went about this in probably the most ineffective way possible, but I just had one um, group that I really wanted to research, which was war, so women against rape, um, and they were conceived 1971. So I was like, all right, I'm going to type in women against rape, and we're going to put all of the articles in chronological art order from 1970s to whenever it stopped getting um, reported. And that's just what I did for like a few days. Um, was it the most effective way to look at data? Probably not. Um, and I did that with multiple organizations because there was just so much info. I had no idea how to narrow it down. I didn't want to miss anything. Um, so I guess to your question, sometimes I just didn't. There was a moment of where I was like, oh, what if I just constrained it to the 90s? Because a lot of my interviewers were from the 90s, but then there was less content that I thought was necessary to contextualize the 90s. Um, so this is a lot of words to say that sometimes I just didn't narrow it down. Like 50 years was a lot of research. Um, Dr. Bond just like me, and that's a lot. And I'm like, yeah, but I already started through it. So we're just going to end see like where it ends up. But I think that being able to narrow it down to certain organizations um, or seeing the patterns of them reoccur in history and how their alumni have influenced current people um, has really helped me narrow down on the ways in which my information could have been formatted. So in that way, um, I think presenting the information um, was really where I could narrow in on very specific groups. So I hope that helped answer your question. Thank you, Mia. Um, Catherine. Uh, I definitely had to be very disciplined with myself. Um, every time I would like open a door and see something, I was like, Catherine, you cannot open that door until later. You just have to wait. So every time I would find something that I was interested in researching later, I would just write it down um, and then I'd come back to it later. I definitely picked uh, Love at a Distance because it felt the most like contemporaneous with you know, what we're dealing with. It felt very like relevant. Um, and I kind of switched over to that. And it was a little hard to not continuously do research for all the different ideas that I was having, because especially in the romance genre, there's a lot of tropes that are layered on top of each other. So I definitely was kind of doing like three projects at once, uh, which, you know, like responsible, no. Do I regret it? No, would do it again. Um, yeah, it's definitely was a matter of being like, you just, you're not allowed to deal with that until later. There's a zillion ways to go, so. Um, what I would say to that question is that I kind of had um, somewhat of the opposite experience. I, I was reading Dr. Matthew's book about Aztec philosophy and he was describing the kind of bias that native philosophers have gotten and I suddenly uh, was transported to my ancient medicine class because in there I was reading about what Plato and Aristotle had to say about non-Greeks and it's virtually the same thing with minor differences. And so I had a very specific um, research interest at the very start and then I had to think, well, um, how can I broaden this into a research paper? Because it's one thing to say, oh, these are the same, but 
it's different to say, well, how did this start to begin with? Where did this prejudice come from? Why are they different? And so, if anything, my project kept getting bigger and bigger over time. Um, as you can probably infer, like when you asked me what the most surprising thing I found was, it wasn't actually about philosophy, it was about trade. Um, and it just happened to be brought up by the same sources. Um, and so I too have had to restrain myself from going off into the deep end. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. I think that I had like the inverse process to most of you in a way. But it's been fun. Okay, if, are there any other questions? I just want to uh, mention that we, this is the event where we usually promote next year's fellowship. Um, we don't have the information handy just yet, um, but when we do have it, um, probably late January, early February, um, I'll encourage you all, especially undergraduate students, to visit um, this website that I just put in the chat. Uh, where we have information about the URLF. So as you can imagine, this year is a little bit different um, as far as being equipped with information early. Um, but um, please look out for that information because you know we love this program and if it's at all possible, you know we want to do it next year as well. So um, thank you so much to all of the students, the fellows. This summer has been, I think, amazing um, despite the setbacks we've had. And I think everybody, if you read the chat, everyone's commenting. Um, so I appreciate everyone sharing their projects and their research and being honest about their process and what they've learned. And I think um, everyone in the audience is coming away with um, more information than they had when they came in and especially the undergraduate students um, thinking about the possibilities of their own research projects. So thank you all so much. Um, and I think that'll do it. Do we have another question? I see. Could I add one more uh, thing? Yes, June. I just wanted to reiterate how thankful we all are for our research mentors. Hana, you're a saint. Thank you so much. We get so much out of mentoring all of you. It is a little selfish for us. You know, we're we're getting as much as you are, if not more. So I learned so much for everyone from everyone I mentor and then from everyone else in the cohort as well. So this is just, you know, a highlight of my year. And I can say that for all of my colleagues who have been mentors, as well as the teaching learning committee. So thank you, Craig. Thank you, teaching learning committee. And um, oh, where will the video recorded video be posted? Hugh, do you have an answer to that one? I was, I was too slow typing my response. Um, <laughs> so what we do after these sessions are recorded is we take a look at the transcript and make sure that it's uh, pretty close to 100% accurate. And then we will post it to the university library's YouTube page. So it usually takes us about a week or so to um, clean up the transcript, but certainly uh, just look for it in about a week on our YouTube page. Right, thank you, Q. And if that's all, we'll, we'll head out, go our separate ways and um, think about all the, all the interesting things we learned. So thank you everyone.